no further ado, Scott. Thanks very much. Thank you. So this is kind of interesting for me because uh, typically um, I give talks at NLP conferences and, and data processing and math heavy things. And um, uh, it's been a long while since I talked about uh, the UI uh, of search and text, which is you know, the stuff that I've been working in for the last 20 years. So um, thank you for having me. I hope what I have to say is interesting. Um, and uh, why don't we get started? Um, so I want to talk a little tonight about just what is text, because it's really such a ubiquitous piece of UI technology on computers, uh, so much so that, that we kind of forget about it all the time. It's just there, and, and most of the things we do with it uh, are so culturally impregnated for the last 5,000 years that, that we don't really look at them. Um, so uh, I want to look how we got to now, and I'm really going to start at the beginning, um, uh, and what that trajectory has been and how text has, as a UI has changed over that time so that we can see that now that we're in this computery, webby, modern day, um, where that trajectory might carry us uh, for the next few years. I'm not going to look too far in the future because uh, that's, that's just always a big mistake. Uh, so the main sections uh, tonight are going to be about the, simply the invention and the development of text um, uh, and meta text, how we talk about text. And since meta text is often as text, but its subject being other text, it qualifies as its own area of study. Um, sort of recursively, uh, and the current history of hypertext and the web, and especially search engines, and you'll see how that all fits together later, and um, uh, I'll start talking about what I think of as the dynamic organization of text, uh, as opposed to sort of the static prehistory of text. So what is text anyway, right? Um, Text is not really written speech, right? It's a different thing entirely. Um, and either um, I'm going to convince you of that over the next half hour or so, or I'm just going to bore you to tears. Um, but if I write it out this way, you've got a very different perspective on, on what I said than if I just flash the words one against the other uh, the way linear speech comes through. Um, and my contention and the, the starting point for all this is that text really is the original information technology. It's the original technology. Uh, and literally, um, it's, it's, it's got the same root uh, as techne, uh, technology, weaving. They're all, uh, they all stem from, from the same, uh, from the same, same place in, in early Indo-European. Um, so given that they are technology, though, this notion that um, we think of them sort of as transcribed speech is an interesting one. And it's a metaphor that's embedded in how we talk about text. Um, and we say that text talks to us. You know, the article says right here, um, you know, look at this statement. We use words like statement, pronouncement, edict, all to mean the text versions of things as well as the spoken versions of things. Um, you know, lately, by lately I mean the last few centuries, we have words for the sorts of things that are encapsulated text, but uh, fundamentally um, there's this underlying metaphor in how we think about it that um, drives our perception of what text is and how to use it. And I'd like to kind of decompose that and, and make you think about it a little bit tonight. So my contention is that text really is an interface. It's an interface to speech and language and communication and um, and they themselves are kind of a layer on top on top of thoughts and ideas they are the means by which we communicate thoughts and ideas and and text is a technological interface that we've imposed on top of that and like any technology like any artifact we've had to invent it and it's gone through multiple generations uh, and multiple revisions over the 5,000 years that we've been doing this um, and like any technology, it's got all of the 
the problems that come along with things people build. Um, text is really non-intuitive. If you think about it, it's the only technology that we literally spend years teaching our children how to use. Um, reading uh, does not come out of the blue. Um, uh, to certain, you know, probably less so than, than driving a car, even. Um, it's got horrible interoperability problems between different, uh, different text regimes, um, different scripts, grammars, layouts, formats, all of that, and horrible backward compatibility problems. Um, you try to read a book now that's even a few hundred years old, and it looks bizarre. Um, so, and these are just entire layers and cues uh, of information that are missing from these previous texts. And that's part of what we'll be talking about, is, is, is how those developed and where they came from. Um, and so, if we're going to talk about text as a, as a technology and a UI, what are some of the properties of it um, that, that separate it from other communication? Uh, obviously, it's visual. Um, but it's also graphical. The layout and interrelation of statements in the text and, and words and how they appear relative to one another adds a huge amount to the meaning. Um, it's indexical. Uh, and by that, I mean, so I know that's an exit to the room because it says exit. There isn't a statement somewhere saying that, oh, the exit is to the right of the, of the screen. Um, it just points to it. If we all had name tags this evening, I'd know who was who. Um, just because the name tag was attached to you. I wouldn't need a description. I wouldn't need anyone to point you out. The words themselves are pointers. Um, it's totally atemporal. It sits around for a long while. Uh, I can read it now. I can read it later. Um, and, it, and at least for the last 5,000 years, it's been a tangible medium. Text is something you can point to, hold, slap on the table, hit somebody over the head. All the good things that you can do with uh, So I'm going to go over the early history of text up until the computer age, uh, and, then, and then we'll see what happens from there. So early on, text is a representation of words, quite literally. Almost every graphical form of a word is given independently. You have these immense symbologies from, from early text uh, 5,000 years ago. Uh, early cuneiform is this way, hieroglyphics, um, the Indus Valley script, um, the early Chinese writing, um, early Mayan writing happens much later, but starts in exactly the same place. Uh, it's entirely symbolic. It's not, uh, uh, it's not phonetic yet. It takes about 2,000 years of bumbling around with using text to represent what we want to say to each other and, and what we want to record to realize slowly that instead of using each symbol to represent what you mean, you can use it to represent what you say. And by making that shift, the symbols become much more generative. You need fewer of them. Uh, and uh, they become much more widely representative. You don't have to come up with a new symbol and introduce everybody to it and tell them what it means. Uh, you can just spell out essentially the, the word you want that they might already be familiar with from spoken text, from spoken language. Um, so it takes about 2,000 years to get there. Uh, and early on uh, uh, in the Mediterranean, we see uh, Greek show up as sort of the first truly phonetic alphabet with, with consonants and vowels. Um, and uh, I think Stephen was making this comment earlier that, that sometimes technology uh, is able to shift much faster when, when structures have been torn down. Um, this shift coincides strangely or not so strangely with um, uh, sort of a uh, the collapse of the Mediterranean civilization, what they call the Bronze Age collapse. Uh, all, of, all of the big civilizations ringing the, Medi ringing the Mediterranean disappeared. Their, their uh, religious orders vanished, uh, and literacy dropped to almost nothing. And out of that rubble, we get a phonetic script, an easier writing, uh, and something that's you know, just a few dozen characters instead of a few thousand in little simple straight lines that's so easy that even a child can learn it. And that's essentially the point. It's, it's so much easier. 
from there, we see very quickly this idea of phonetic alphabet spread across the world um, to everywhere but China, uh, which is an interesting cultural question. Um, the Latin alphabet shows up around 500. Brahmi script shows up in India as a phonetic script. Um, what's so interesting there is that all of the classical Indian literature that had been um, literature, I say, that, has, that, had, that had been uh, written, again, the wrong word, composed perhaps for the thousand years prior to that, um, was all kept in an oral tradition. Um, all of the Vedas were not written down for the first thousand years or so until we get to this point in history. Um, so very, very early texts, we're still talking about 3,000 years ago, uh, are things like transcribed speech, property sale records, religious pronouncements, the medium that you have to write in is horribly difficult, but very persistent, typically. Uh, and there are very few people who actually use this stuff. Um, and it's very tricky to use. So let's break through some of these details again. Um, uh, some facets that, that show up really early are this sort of linear layout, right to left, left to right, uh, top to bottom. Uh, and those things have maintained pretty constantly. Very few people write in little spirals or ellipses or or checkerboard patterns. Uh, it, it just makes sense. Um, in the first few thousand words, there are no word breaks in most languages, primarily because they're all symbologies. You can separate one word from the next because it's a different symbol. You get word breaks in a few languages that are abjads, which are consonantal languages, like uh, sort of like early modern Arabic or Hebrew. Um, you don't write out the, the vowels, you just write the consonants. And in order to separate the meaning, you have to put in some kind of break. Uh, so what does this stuff look like? I'm always fascinated by this stuff. Um, uh, this is a court record for uh, some uh, farm slave. Um, there's no, there's very little layout to this. It's just kind of run on words, except for the reverse side, which uh, I don't have a laser pointer, I guess. Um, the reverse side has a list of names who sort of countersign for this fellow. Uh, and they're all preceded by a little arrow. Uh, but other texts from the same time, um, just as giant run-on script. Uh, so this is the Gilgamesh flood tablet from, from about uh, 2300 BC or something. Uh, and it just reads right to left uh, in a constant flow. There are almost no breaks. Uh, they don't correspond to structural breaks in the text. There's no, nothing like a paragraph. There's nothing like a sentence ending. There's nothing like a word break. That style of writing continues for 2,000 years until we get to uh, classical Greek. And, and, and it's the same in classical Greek, I'm saying. So this is the Constitution of At Athens. Uh, it's written by Aristotle, sort of a prehistory of Athens in the classical period. Um, there are no word breaks in classical Greek. Uh, it's just read phonetically as if you were talking to yourself and you have to essentially say it to yourself to understand where to break between words. There are no sentence stops. Even the parts of this that are poetry uh, have no marking. You can only recognize them um, by the text that introduces them and then the scansion within the poetry itself. Um, and there's really no other process for reading other than reading the stuff aloud and to yourself. So it's a very different experience than what we have today where you can look at a page and read silently and scan all across it. You have to read these things linearly. It's a very different interaction. Um, going on from that, um, about 500 BC, uh, Latin gets smart and starts separating words. They have a symbol called the interpunct, which separates uh, words, very nice. Greek comes up with a thing they call the paragraph, uh, which marks out little sections. It's just uh, sort of an M dash that you stick in the text. Um, uh, somewhere around the height of the empire, um, Latin loses its mind um, and, and decides that they're going to just throw everything together. Um, but then again, as the Latin empire falls through to plague, invasion, Sometime in this period, about 50% of the, the, the Roman Latins uh, died due to plague. The rest of the empire 
fell under control of other people. Latin comes back with word spaces, with a minuscule, a lowercase, that you can write much more quickly, that you can read much more quickly. Um, so again, this is notion that as cultural institutions kind of fail and turn over, the technology that goes, that supports them, can also turn over and, and innovate. Uh, it takes another 500,000 years before we see things like paragraph separation. Um, sentences show up here also around 1,000, um, but the paragraph is an interesting thing. Literally, again, it's a, it's a, it's a paragraph. It's a mark within the text uh, that separates uh, chunks. And it takes another few hundred years uh, before we see indented paragraphs in the kind of layout that might start to be familiar. Um, but before this, and I'll show a few more examples, text just looks like you know, a giant run-on. Um, this is, uh, uh, I, I, I chose classics for these, why not? This is the, the Tale of Tristan and Isolde, written out in about 1300. Um, the only thing that, that marks it is uh, this capital H that separates a, a chapter. Um, but then from there, it runs on for pages with no separation, no, no nothing. Um, a couple hundred years later, this is a, a Latin grammar. Um, you start to see a, a sentential break using a paragraph marker. Um, and you see a mixed upper lower case and something that begins to look like, um, uh, like italic, well, what we'll call italic script when it, when it, when it becomes printing. Um, at the same time, um, you know, this is one of the most famous books in the world. This is the Gutenberg Bible. There is almost no semantic layout in this whole thing. Um, there are uh, chapter breaks uh, given by these, uh, these hand-lettered uh, capitals. Other than that, there's no, there's no break in the text at all. You have to do the same you know, style of classical antiquity and to read the thing through linearly. Um, unless you go through and you mark it up yourself. Um, so all of, the, all of the things that we associate with text graphically uh, and visually d still don't exist. Um, and, this, and this really is the beginning of the modern period. Um, so let's talk about the physical form uh, of this stuff for a little while. So for the first 2,000 years, we had rolls or stone tablets. And the rolls were papyrus rolls like we saw with the... Uh, Aristotle, and uh, they're a little hard to use. Um, there's no random access. Uh, there's no. Um, there's no way to bookmark them. Uh, you can't. You can't easily leave them open without them rolling off or uh, closing up. Um, and they're hard to stack and shelve and, and label. Um, around. 200, we start to see the introduction of the codex, which is what you'd normally think of as a book, you know, pages with a bound spine. Um, this isn't because it was invented here in 200. Um, you can see examples of it pop up here and there hundreds of years before, 500 years before. There are examples of codexes, codices. But nobody uses them. They don't catch on. The reason they catch on here is because there's this really fervent group of people, uh, uh, of users, who are, who are uh, really bound to this format. And they are the early Christians who have their Bible written out as a codex. And it's got, it's hugely more useful than the scrolls. It's got random access, you can bookmark it, you can stack it, you can label it. Um, it takes a thousand years more before we see chapter headings at the top of the page. Uh, separating the previous section from the new section. Um, the printing press shows up eventually. Um, and it's only after the printing press that anybody bothers to use page numbers. Because before that, every copy was entirely unique. And it didn't make any sense to number a page for reference because nobody had the same pagination that you do. Uh, so it's only after the pagination becomes standard that page numbers seem like a good idea. So all of these sort of minor feature inventions go along with a usability um, that is enabled by the physical form. Part of what's happening here from the early days to now, uh, and will be a continuing theme, is that 
there's more and more stuff wrapped around and into the text. It's not just a string of letters and a string of words that represented written speech. It now has graphical structure. It's got a, a standard physical form. It's got metadata pointing to different parts so that you can refer to them externally. Um, it's got pieces so that you can recognize where you are in the text. So things like running page heads at the top of every left and right page so you know what section you're in when you open the book. Um, tables of contents, back of the book indices, things like references don't show up really well until um, you know, practically the Victorian age. Um, references um, in the back of a paper or the back of a book don't show up until the 20th century. Um, so if you look at any science papers, math papers from before that, you, you won't see any of this. Um, and uh, I've got some more examples. Um, so this is Newton's Principia. Uh, this, is, uh, this is actually Newton's Principia. The, the British Museum has this, uh, and they've uh, scanned it and put it online. Uh, this is his first edition. He's making notes of correction for his, for his next one. Um, so uh, end of the 17th century, it's got page numbers. This is great. It's got no table of contents. It's got no index. It's got no running heads. If you open to the middle, you don't know what section you're in. You can't remember. You have to bookmark it. Um, and it's in Latin, um, written by an English scientist living in England for a primarily English audience. Um, and in some sense, usability is really the anti pattern here. It's, it's not designed to be easily digested and understood by anyone else. There's sort of a, 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 a crypto academic nature to, to writing at that time. Um, 50 years later, it has been translated into English, but otherwise nothing has changed. Um, it takes you know, another 75 years for the same English translation to be the, the major one in circulation. Uh, to finally get a subject index um, at the back, but it still has no table of contents. Um, however, sort of in that same time, in that 18th century time, you start to see things that really look like modern books, um, that have page numbers, that have chapter headings, uh, that have things like running heads and quotation marks and liberal typo typography. So this is using um, slant text, it's using small capitals, it's using all kinds of things, um, uh, different font sizes for different pieces. Uh, and so some, some, some uh, really gung-ho graphic designer has gotten his hands on a printing press and has really gone to town. Uh, and they're trying out all these new ideas. And some of them stabilize and become mechanisms that we see used over and over again. Um, and what we're seeing is more and more metadata being wrapped around the words that indicate what each section of word means and what the pieces um, are and how they relate to one another and how it all fits together. Um, so things like, uh, I was saying, you know, references and citations don't come till the 19th and 20th century. Um, a full catalog for a library doesn't come about till the same time either. Um, what we had before that was literally a bibliography, a log of the books that you happened to have. And even the most powerful people in the world might only have a few thousand volumes. You know, the King of France might have a few thousand volumes in the 17th century. Um, by the 18th century, uh, the French Republic took over and confiscated everybody's books and put them together, and now they needed to catalog them. Uh, so we get into this, this problem of volume. So um, the other thing we see going through the historical record here is that the volume of text uh, is increasing. Um, and you know, if you talk to Kurzweil, he'd draw a nice logarithmic plot for that. Um, I don't know if it quite fits, but it, it's, it, it gets huge through this time. And you really need some mechanism to, some metatextual mechanism to reference all of these things and keep them straight. And so that piece of text, the metatext, um, becomes a subject of study, right? And you know, many of you here are old enough to have used these things and remember them fondly or not. Some of you may not be. Um, but uh, you know, every, every book had its card. Every subject uh, had cards that referred back to books. Every author had a card with all the books that they wrote. 
Um, you know, and maybe since everybody's looking at these all the time, we could stick gads on them or something. Uh, okay. Uh, references. So references in text are really interesting because um, they're the things that the author has really intended to say, well, this piece of text really relates to that subject as opposed to somebody else looking at it from the outside. Um, and for the three, first 3,000 years or so of text, um, references, or four, I guess, um, text uh, references really are just that. They're references. They're sort of a, an inline thing like this. You know, is it published by that worthy gentleman in the year 1659, right? So this is late 17th century. This is written. Um, the same style of reference shows up 2,000 years earlier in Pliny. You know, you can read his history, and he's got great references for, like, three estimates of the size of the, the circumference of the world. Um, and he references each of the authors who, who developed and, and worked them out. Um, but it's the same sort of inline conversational style. Um, and we start to see that change uh, with the scientific enlightenment, um, where there's footnotes, a sort of somewhat standardized notion of a reference, maybe a page number, a title. You start to get things like journal titles and series titles, all to organize these masses of text that we didn't have organized before. Um, so these are all taken out of the, uh, the proceedings of the Royal Society uh, from right around 1800. Um, so just to recap, the last 500, 5,000 years, uh, we had uh, a graphical representation of language, which was a huge invention, but just on its own, sort of only looked like speech. And as people recognized all of these interaction features that don't look like speech, the sort of uh, atemporal, nonlinear nature of it, the indexical nature of it, we're slowly adopting technological features of text that allow us to do new things. And it becomes a giant collection of physical artifacts, which we need to keep track of. So where do we get to now? Right? And so now it really is defined by the last 100 years. Um, and I start here with uh, punch cards, because punch cards really are the first time where we've got text that you can't read. The text is written in a form and you suddenly need some mechanical intervention to turn it into something that you can make sense out of. So you can run the cards through uh, a, a typer, and it, and it will type them out. Um, and you can find out what's in your stack of cards. Um, and that's continuous, right? You know, now, all the text I consume, anyway, 90% of it, I still have giant piles of books in my house. But by far, the most reading I do is mediated by a smart device. Um, and the text itself is in a representation that I can't read. I can't even see it. It's microscopic. Um, so you know, there's probably something on this list that, that for, each, for each thing on this list, there's probably at least somebody in the audience who doesn't know it. Uh, so I'll give a tiny uh, overview of it all. But, but this is sort of modern history, and I figure everybody's more familiar with this stuff than the old stuff. So Ranganathan is this uh, library scientist who essentially um, uh, took over the Indian libraries at the end of the British Raj period and, and modernized them through uh, Indian independence. So India has these thousand, thousands of years of literature, plus all the English literature. They were overflowing with books and needed some way to straighten them out. And so he's credited really with starting of scientific library science and this notion of faceted classification, where you have multiple classifications and categories for every item, as opposed to, I've got one item, so it needs to go in one place on the shelf, uh, which is typically how people looked at it before that, like a Dewey Decimal number. There's one number for the book. It goes here. Um, uh, Vannevar Bush. Um, uh, came up with this Memex idea that, that some of you may have heard of, this giant library of, of, of little microfilm documents that you can retrieve and, and edit and, and reuse. Um, and it's, people look at it and they think it's science fiction for the 30s, but he was going on real technology. Um, 
a few years earlier, people had developed essentially bit-coded um, microfilm schemes where, where the edges of the film were coded light in light-dark patterns and could be recognized and sorted and routed um, using uh, optoelectronics. It was amazing, crazy stuff. Um, Ted Nelson uh, describes hypertext and transclusion. He's still upset that we haven't gotten it right. Um, uh, right here in town, Engelbart uh, demos you know, collaborative text editing and text that's living on a network more than it is on any particular device. Um, Karen Spark Jones and Jerry Sultan uh, are responsible for inventing the TFIDF formulation that really allows us to have search engines that, that give you at least some handle on what to do with millions of documents because you can no longer have humans catalog all these things consistently. Um, the networks were invented um, right here. That's kind of interesting. Uh, um, and, uh, and then HTML comes along 25 years ago. Um, and I'd say the rest is history, but, but th this, is, this is the now. The rest was history. Um, so now we've got uh, the World Wide Web is really the most stable platform for, for understanding what text is and for distributing text. And some people say it's the biggest change since Gutenberg. And I'd say it's at least the biggest change since Codex. And it might be the biggest change since uh, you know, phonetic writing. Um, and, and what we've got now is this giant interconnected system of text that's truly random access. You can get to anywhere. It's persistent. Uh, it's, it's sort of mixable and remixable, and it's universal in the sense that it's all one giant collection. Any piece can point to any piece. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that's not on the web um, that's, you know, that actually is in paper or is off on isolated systems, but, but let's consider this. I mean, this is a big enough problem to talk about, so we're just going to stick with this. Um, and the big introduction is one piece of metadata um, that we didn't have before. Right, which is the link. You used to have citations and references, but they required work. Um, and now you've got this thing that's really an active citation, and it lets you sort of abstract away all of this uh, complex process of getting from one document and going back to the library or the shelf and finding another one and, and, and taking a look at that. And it speeds up that process dramatically but it, it also changes, it's not just a speed increase, it, it, it changes the nature of what it all is by, by interconnecting everything. Um, and so if we look at what the old catalog interaction was, you might be reading some document that had a reference, you would go to the card catalog, find that reference, figure out where it was gonna be, maybe it was the wrong one, you go back to the document, figure it out, there's a little loop there, Either you or somebody else gets sent to the stacks to find this thing and bring it back for you. Now you have another document, you know, tomorrow afternoon. Um, it's not quite this easy, but it looks like this now, right? You've got a link in one document, and you click, and now you're in another document. Uh, and you can see the two uh, pieces back and forth and understand their relationship. And um, all of the... the the effort you spent in this interaction with sort of the giant text system, you know, the, the, the written pieces plus their storage containers plus their indexing mechanism um, has all been abstracted away to a couple hundred milliseconds when you get the next document over, over Wi-Fi. Um, and, it's, and it's almost as easy as flipping to the next page or sometimes easier. Um, and so that brings us here. Um, it's really random access, it's universal, and we've got the compute power to read through everything on the web, um, or at least some organizations do. You know, Google has read everything on the web uh, and can make use of it. And we'll talk about what you could do if you actually read everything. Um, but um, so, so the substrate used to be an artifact. It used to be dumb. It was stone or papyrus or paper. You wrote it down, and there it sat. It was just text. But now, because all of the text is mediated, 
you know, through projectors, through computers, through the web. Um, the text has become smart because it's really part of the substrate. You can't have the text without that substrate anymore. Um, and that's something that we've been very slow to catch on to over the last 25 years. And it's starting, it's starting to change. Uh, and we'll talk about what those changes are in a sec. Um, so, but, you know, there's still some problems. Um, so before search engines, we used to try to write links into our pages. Right? You'd actually put in an href and you'd find what the most appropriate place to link to was. Um, and they were actually in the text and easy to follow. And it's an implicit recommendation from the author that this, this is a good reference, this is a good place to go. Um, but this is limited by the knowledge of the person writing the original text. Um, and in some sense, it's, it's temporally limited in the sense that the, the, the text is permanent and atemporal. Um, you can only write links when you're writing the paper. You can only write them backward in time. Right? Somebody later can write a, a link from your thing forward in time, but you, you don't know the other references yet because they don't exist. Um, so the authors are at a real disadvantage. Um, so so there's, there's too much stuff it's changing all the time, and so we leave it to the search engines now. Um, and the search engines sort of cover up this link shortage because they have a panoptic view of the world. Um, you've got Google, for instance, it's read everything on the web, and it really knows how it fits together. So, you know, this is sort of the old um, library interaction. You're reading something, uh, suddenly there's something new you need to go find, it references a paper or some idea, or um, you suddenly want to go see videos of cats. Uh, you go off to Google, you have to, you know, you tell it something, uh, it comes back with a set of links, you kind of review those, maybe you do it again, and you come back with something new to read. Um, so the search engine's smart enough to give you um, all these candidate pages because it's really, it's read everything. Um, and it's really smart enough to do it using your little two and a half word uh, sort of pigeon, you know, noun phrase query. Uh, and it doesn't have any idea of what you were doing and it doesn't have any idea of, of the context you were in at the time that you got there, but it does know what everybody else uh, in the world has done when they typed that thing in and which pages they went to and what they like to see. So it's got some advantages, but it's really missing out. Um, and I, I just want to use this moment to, to, to kind of point out that, you know, with all the, the, the furor about AI these days, we have AI and we're all using it every day. It's just like with everything that's AI and has been since Minsky, as soon as it works, we call it engineering. Uh, so, you know, the idea that you can type a couple words into Google and it'll sort through 10 billion pages and return you anything even remotely interesting uh, is, you know, is a probabilistic miracle. Um, and, and so we have this kind of magic, query sensitive, on demand set of text in the world. Um, and it's really amazing that it's there, and it's really broken in, in a bunch of ways, too. Uh, and let's talk about some of those. So it pushes so much effort back on you. Um, you were busy reading something. You were off on your computer reading some page, and you had some thought, or you saw somebody's name. And now you have to go to this other thing. You have to go to Google. You have to figure out what to say to it. And it's not like what you'd say to a person. It's not, it's not regular language. It's like restricted search query language. And we're all pr probably pretty good at it because we do you know, computers and we live in the Bay Area. Um, but if, if you go talk to uh, the text interface design folks, you talk to Dan Russell at Google and you go through some of his user studies, you will be appalled at what people type in expecting to get answers. And then you will be doubly amazed that they actually get answers. Um, so this whole smart text system is, is a little boggling. But then you have to do all this work. You have to look at the results. You have to choose something. Um, so you know, you've got this same loop. Um, and it looks pretty much like this old loop, you know, just faster. Um, but there's a lot of things 
that the old one had that the new one's missing. So um, the new one creates this giant hub and spoke model. You go to the search engine, because you don't know everything in the world, um, and it's indexed everything. You ask a little question, it brings you back 10 or 20 results. You've got no, con inter you've got no context for the interaction. It doesn't know what you were doing, what text you were looking at before. Um, so there's no, there's no interaction that it knows, and there's no uh, logical context. It, if, if it only knew what page you were reading about Hillary Clinton, it might not you know, send you to the gun nut page. It might send you to some other page, right? Based just on, on what it sees you do. Um, has no memory of what you searched for yesterday and, and which thing you liked. It's got kind of a global memory. It's, it averages over everybody, but it doesn't know who you are. And it's got this really difficult query model. There's so many things you cannot ask Google. We're used to just being able to ask the things we can ask, and we've forgotten that there's other things that you should be able to ask uh, that, that you can. And, and you've also lost the, the sort of serendipitous peripheral vision around the content. You don't know, like if you're reading a magazine, right? You've got one article that you're reading, and there's others in front and back, and they sort of go along with it. If you're on a web page, the number of people who like flip to another page on that single site is minuscule. You go off someplace else. You follow a link or you go off to a search engine. There's no sort of context. You know, if you're in the middle of a book, um, you don't know what other books were on the shelf next to that. In the in the web view of the world, um, so the things that we've that we've seen happen for the last five thousand years, with the giant increase in metadata around text, um, is only going to increase. Um, we're going to have more data about usage, about popularity. We're going to see people's comments on the content be folded back in as recommendations, and um, sort of ranking fodder. Um, reviews of content, of, of, of the text itself, of the thing the text is talking about, of the way in which it's spoken, of the author. All of those things are going to be collected more and more and more. Um, who wrote them, when they wrote them, what their other network uh, uh, connections are with the authors, with the content. We're going to see even more data. Um, the, the amount that people are writing and generating is just going up and up and up. Um, and some of it's going to be implicit data, you know, what were you doing, transcribed speech, all kinds of conversations. And we're suddenly starting to see conversations between humans and computers. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, noise these days about, about uh, conversational bots, um, which are just going to generate more and more text to try to understand what the rest of the text means and how to fit it all together. Um, and that's going to drive things like translation and help systems and summarization systems and uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of things that we're getting out of, essentially, text data. It's the text data that's the substrate for all those things. And so these AI systems that are learning from all this are just going to get smarter and bigger uh, and know so much more about what the world is and what people do in it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about kind of what those things are going to look like. Um, and, and I have some candidates up here. Uh, and I've been working on some myself that fall into these categories. Um, uh, you, you know, so we, we, th this quote ridiculously came up just before the talk. Uh, that the future is already here. There are systems that try to do all of these things to some respect with text and text interaction already, but um, they're not widely available. Most people don't know about them, or if they do, they only apply to some narrow subdomain or some little thing. They're not generic, like the web is generic. I mean, there were interlinked systems long before the World Wide Web. Um, but uh, until there was a universal system with a standard and, and we had this social enculturation uh, to make it happen, um, it, didn't, it didn't mean much yet. Um, so um, 
uh, you know, so like this last one, augmented reality. We're starting to see some of that. Um, you know, we had the Pokemon Go uh, phenomenon this week. It's not uh, text, but you can easily imagine an augmented reality system where everything is labeled. Well, you know, you can look around at a person, you now know who they are, or you know what street you're on, or you know what happened here last night, um, or you know what event is going to be playing at this bar, you know, next Friday, just because you're there and you've got this sort of augmented reality view. And the way that's going to be related is text. And so again, text becomes not this artifact, you know, it's not like written on a whiteboard outside the building when you go. Um, it's special text generated just for you because of your particular context and circumstances. Um, and it's entirely mediated by the smart devices that are now the substrate. Um, so what do I mean by context-aware links? Um, links on most web pages are totally static. Um, they don't know what's going on. You may, and in fact, most articles don't have links in them anymore because of these sort of authoring problems uh, I was talking about. Most of the links are relegated to sidebars and menus and, and search engines. Um, content doesn't have links anymore. Um, but there's a bunch of things in text that you might still want links to. Um, citations, I mean, that if, things, if something's obviously a citation, it would be great to, to make it alive. Um, uh, names, dates, addresses, uh, place names, events, movies, all these things, you know, you could automatically recognize these things. The machine's already read everything on the web and know essentially what you might want to do if you were formulating a search query sort of centered around that topic, that idea that's represented by that bit of text. Um, we see a little of this um, uh, in consumer products, which is great, right? So my phone now has this peak thing. If somebody puts an address uh, in plain text, they don't have to make a map link. The machine, just by displaying it, obviously has read the text. Right? It has to read the text in order to show you the text. Uh, it's this intermediary. So it reads it, it knows it's an address, and goes, oh, let's make a link. And then you've got a map. Same thing for dates and times. You can go off to calendar entries. You can go see schedules. Um, you can select text and go do a search without having to type stuff in and go through that sort of jump out of context, formulated query loop. Um, so there's a little bit in which people are making those links closer to the source material. Um, there's other stuff. So this is an ancient thing. This is, uh, um, this is uh, the Talmud. Uh, it's an annotated version of the Bible. The Bible uh, in Hebrew here is a tiny little piece in the middle of the, of the document. All the colored stuff around it is, uh, is commentary, sort of. Um, and uh, again, it needs a social context in which to say which comments matter and which ones are we, we going to publish. Um, but uh, we're starting to see this exact sort of stuff on the web in a universal sense. And they tried to get it in in the mid-90s. Uh, if you talk to Andreessen, or if you look back at the mailing list, he proposed putting in uh, annotation on the web back in 96 or something like that. Um, but the infrastructure wasn't there because you need some central repository for people's comments, right? So, you, this, so Rap Genius, which is now Genius, has this you know, annotate everything on the web system. You can pull up a web page, have a Rap Genius plugin, add your comments to the page, make them available to some select group of people or to everybody. Uh, and other people can read what the commentary is on this text. Um, Hypothesis is doing the same thing um, with a, a structure sort of more geared toward um, uh, scientific writing. So for instance, they've got um, a large coalition of climate scientists around the world annotating each other's papers and annotating um, uh, news reports about climate change for scientific accuracy and, and, and impact. Um, Medium and Quartz are sort of doing this in their own little, little ecosystems. Um, Reddit's whole purpose on the web is to take links and have people talk about them. Um, wouldn't it be nice to invert that so when you're at the page you could see what everybody on Reddit said about it? Well, yeah, maybe, you know, Reddit's another, you know, maybe don't want to go there. 
Uh, but you have other places that are collecting huge amounts of data about links, right? You know, every, every other Twitter uh, <coughs> comment has a link, every other tweet, whatever. Um, uh, half of Facebook are reposts of articles and pages and, and things on the web. Um, and there's no real way to aggregate what people are saying. Um, and I'm sure they're thinking about it, but the power is going to come when the giant machine in the, in the background that has read everything can digest those things and show you what the aggregate info is from whatever point of view you might need. You essentially have a conversation with the machine that, that has read all that text and knows what, what the interaction is. Um, so, uh, right, so, so these things are sort of ways to proactively generate searches for all the text that you didn't know was out there uh, in some place that isn't the page you're looking at. And it, it allows you to skip that formulate query step where you're typing something into Google and you don't know quite what to express or how to get what you need. And so this smart text, this combination of the, the machine that's reading and displaying your text um, uh, and all of the things it has seen before uh, are able to organize this stuff for you going forward. Um, and we see that some in sort of uh, scientific papers. Um, so Sightseer uh, is a great repository for computer science and physics and, and, and now also biology and other papers. Uh, their explicit purpose early on was to do information extraction and parse the citations and get the real citation network rather than have people, library scientists, go write it down, which is what they used to do. There's a bound volume in the library uh, of, of citation references. Um, but um, it doesn't necessarily construct a live link back to the other sources and really construct a layer of web on top of the web that's all these citations. Um, but all these things are, are getting smarter and smarter, uh, the devices are, so why not do that directly in the device. Um, and you can start to see that. Um, so ferret here, uh, the last entry, is something especially for bioscience. If you're reading a bioscience paper, uh, it'll bring up a sidebar, tell you all of the citations from and to that document. It will extract all of the interesting um, uh, protein names and chemical names out of the text and sort of give you searches and sub-indices for those. It'll tell you how often they show up in the text and kind of give you a little mini-map and summary of, of, of what that thing was. All because your desktop is smart enough to read the paper and understand it to that degree, um, which a print book uh, or, or a stone tablet, God forbid, uh, doesn't even come close. Um, there's this thing called Greenhouse, uh, which is a, uh, it's like a 20-line browser plug-in, um, and it scans for the names of congressmen in text, and then uh, gives you a link to show you uh, funding sources uh, for those. So there's a special purpose thing. It's just got a little regex list of, of people's names to match, and then shows you uh, how much money they're getting from different sorts of institutions. And this runs live in your browser, so you can, so the text that you're reading is live. You don't have to link off and do this and, and think about that kind of search. Um, so this is what text is moving toward. The, 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 the thing you're reading itself, and I've said this about 17 times already, I'll keep saying it, is smart and will start to do things for you that you never knew could be done with the information that's on the page. Um, you see a date on the page, great, pull it off, stick it on a calendar, reference it back to the page. Now you know that something might be happening on that date. So you know, a month from now when you're looking at your calendar, you're saying, well, you know, I'm free Tuesday. What's happening on Tuesday? Ah, there's a Beikai talk. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> um, is there a person's name? Is it news? Are there related stories, right? The machine has read everything already. It can tell you what stories relate to this one and give you a whole timeline, what built up to this story, uh, what other people are involved in this thing, what topics, what institutions, um, uh, what events sort of uh, are, are in that mix. Is it a public figure with some canonical information? We can link directly off to that. Um, and so it becomes this kind of proactive device that's always looking at the possible extensions of the information you have on the page. Um, and it becomes this reading assistant. It's reading right along with you, right over your shoulder. 
um, telling you stuff. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I've been thinking about this is I've been trying to build one of those uh, myself, right? So, so back quote is this thing that I've started uh, a little while ago, and it uh, reads the news basically along with you, and tries to construct links and summaries out of this text in place. So, I mean, this stuff's totally possible right now on a generic scale. I don't need a little regex list of, of names in the text. I can use natural language processing to figure out who's important, where they link to, uh, do topical and, and, uh, and uh, uh, event classification and build timelines out of these things. Um, so, you know, oh, you're reading a document about the Supreme Court? Well, here's Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg right? And here's other headlines that she showed up in uh, this week. Uh, you can link off and get a summary. Um, you know, so out of the middle of that summary, six months ago, this is stuff that's happening. Try to do a search on Google News or any other sort of online news source for what happened with a person six months ago. It read those documents, but there's no way that the, that the search interface allows you to kind of put it back in the, time con con uh, the, the timeline. Um, and it certainly can't say, well, all of these stories are about the same event, and those ones are a different event, but it has the same people, and this next one is the same event. Right? So all of those things are going to be possible uh, as we go with text. So just to kind of round out and uh, stop talking now, it's been about an hour. Um, uh, you know, what I tried to show with the history part of this talk is that text really is fundamentally a technology. It's a UI technology to the information that's embedded in the, in the text. Um, and that changes in that technology are incredibly glacially slow because they require social adoption. They require everybody to understand them and be able to interoperate with them and move along. So as you invent interfaces and you invent text features that you want people to use and understand, um, you have to be aware that it's, it's going to be a slow road. Um, um, and, uh, and now the future part of the talk uh, has been that text is really intertwined with, with these smart machines that are our only way to get at most of it. Um, everything you read is intermediated by, you know, this supercomputer that I carry around with me. Um, that'll sound ridiculous in five years. Um, uh, and, and the text becomes dynamic and, uh, and you can actively reorganize both what you're reading and, as it turns out, everything else that has been written um, can be included in that calculation to show you what connects with what you're reading and where you might want to go and what else you might want to read. And that's kind of the end of it. So I thank you very much for coming and listening to all of that. And I'd love to take questions if you have any. Microphones for you to speak into. So you spoke about the uh the lack of card catalog connection and um, the, sorry, uh, OWL and RDF seem like they were an attempt to sort of get that back. Um, and those graphing technologies are becoming common. The latest version of solar has those. Sorry if I'm geeking out too much. No, that's good. Um, the latest version of solar includes uh, graph functionality so that you could go um, look at the nearest um, related documents uh, if, if that's being stored in there. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, yes. Um, so RDF is this um, uh, piece of technology that falls under the umbrella of semantic web. And the idea is to represent um, sort of attribute values that go along with uh, whatever they're attached to. So in this case, you know, web pages might have a set of attribute values about who was the author and what subject is it and, and what other documents might fall into that same category. Traditionally, a lot of the stuff that people have wanted to code up in RDF has essentially been hand coding. They've moved the kind of metadata that was on a card catalog into the RDF. 
so that you know, somebody has to come along and say, okay, this is a computer science paper and it's about you know, inverted index optimization or whatever. Um, and like stick that onto the document. Um, other things like the author and the time it was produced and that sort of stuff can be done automatically, but a lot of the semantic level was and still is hand coded and that's the place it falls down that as long as you're relying on people to try to label this stuff in especially in shorthand like that um, you're going to lose because the computer can already read the entire document and get some clues out of that um, but to condense it down to a few RDF triples um, really impoverishes the content and I, there's more to say, but I think that's where it falls down. Um, Up here. Yep. Thank you for the presentation. That was awesome. Coming, going from the history and coming all the way uh, to recent. Um, my question was about wearables. How do you see wearable devices and small devices, small screens, changing the text, the concept of text that we have today? Because I don't see us using the references or paragraphs or those concepts on wearables or small screens anymore. And it seems like we are moving towards that. We are moving towards smaller screens and more summarized view and uh, words as opposed to big text, chunk of text uh, explaining the concept. I think that's, that's true. So, so in, the, in the context of wearables and, and, and mobile and sort of text while you're moving through the world, um, you, you're right. You don't want to be inundated with huge amounts, you know, paragraphs and pages worth of stuff. Um, but text still has those... Um, uh, if you think back to the to the to the beginning, sort of the the, uh, the affordances of, of text slide, um, uh, simply the fact that it's indexical uh, is really useful. So if you if you had some like uh, you know head up uh, wearable display, and you could look around and actually see labels on stuff, um, the labels are still text and give you a way to uh, represent a lot of information in a very small graphical framework. Um, uh, having, having it be audio or having it be purely symbolic or other things really um, just ignores um, all of the benefits, that, the density benefits and the sort of atemporal notion that you get from text. You can put up those labels on things and look away uh, and still be thinking about them or look back at them and see them again later when you really want to see them. Um, you can essentially take snapshots of it and look at it again later and it becomes fixed in time. If it's something on your phone or, you know, sort of the uh, uh, texting between, between two people or between you and the machine, um, again, it's short text snippets, but, but short doesn't mean um, contentless. I think all of the things I'm talking about apply uh, to, to short text um, as well, right? So if you say, you know, are you going to be there for dinner tomorrow? Um, and you're scratching your head going, do I have dinner plans tomorrow? Um, your phone sees dinner tomorrow and knows that might be a thing on your schedule and sees if there's an event on your schedule or maybe a reference to it in email or, or in some other message about where you picked the place and can easily put up that other text. I mean, this isn't obviously something available today, but you, you, you could see it's not really that far off where it has read all that stuff and knows how to sort of slice and dice it appropriately for the context. Um, <clears throat> most, of the, uh, most, most of the examples, uh, if not all of the examples of the future of the text were regarding text as information, science, uh, scheduling, things like that. What is your... Um, opinion on text as literature, where uh, there seem to be no such a big need for actual links between things, but text as, I don't know, stories, um, and uh, your opinion on a future of printed, printed books? This is a great question. No, I didn't talk about it. I, you, know, I, you can see I already ran 
way over the time I, 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 I might have. Um, uh, you're already starting to see some of it. So if you have a Kindle, uh, and a lot, you, know, you take War and Peace, and you open it on your Kindle, and you get somewhere in the middle, and you go, you know, oh, who is this you know, count? Um, uh, the Kindle will tell you where that character showed up in the plot line. You can go back to where they were introduced, see what happened back then, jog your memory, come back to where you're reading. And things like that, um, you know, take away some of the uh, traditional means, right? You, you know, often you might have to go back to chapter two and actually reread it to figure out what was happening and jog your mind about so much more. But um, uh, there's, I think there are lots of opportunities for that sort of um, thing in text. In fact, um, even early on in the, I think this was in the 80s, a film of this just came out, uh, was, was found and re-released. Uh, Andy Van Dam uh, at Brown um, uh, early on, this is like pre-web days, um, did a hypertext literature class. He worked with the English department um, to teach, uh, they, they, they were teaching you know, undergrad literature. Um, and to have a system that had links to different authors, different poets, snippets from books um, was, they didn't quite know how to use it yet because it was the first time that had ever been done. Um, but the, uh, the literature side uh, of that collaboration um, found it incredibly interesting and, and really quite valuable. Um, and so it was just a few months ago that somebody sort of rediscovered this experiment, found that there had been um, some film footage of of the actual students and discussion of it, and that's somewhere on the on the web now, right? If you look for Andy Van Dam and hypertext, you might find it. He's better known for his graphic stuff, but that was a fascinating experiment. Um, but uh, I could ramble on this for a long time. We you catch me after. Um, I'd love to talk about that side. Yeah, uh, you sort of asked the rhetorical question about uh, why not pepper all of these uh, sort of peripheral pieces of information, meta information about the thing that you're, you're consuming uh, directly in line. And um, my first answer would be like, because it's incredibly distracting. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the challenges that breaking down a persistent canonical view of information, just not just for yourself, but for like over time, but also uh, a, a commonly understood point of reference for what information is and how it's uh, obtained. Like, are there any things that we can do there to lock it down, or are those two sort of things in direct tension? You know, the, the, the flexibility of being able to call these things up versus the consistency and the, the, the touchstones for people to be able to say, I have read this thing. It, it actually was the same thing as you read. Right. I think those are somewhat antagonistic, um, but I'm hopeful um, that so, so I mean, this has already come out over the last few years with this notion of filter bubble, um, that, that the things you're reading um, may be quite different than what your neighbor reads simply because of the friends you have and the links they share. You might be getting a totally different view of the world and the news and, and everything um, because you're sort of in a different subgraph of the web. Um, but I think at least one force that fights against that is this panoptic vision that the, that the search engine view affords. Because you've got, it's really read everything. And if you can, um, if, if you have something to, to show that's not as impoverished as 10 blue links on a page in response to a query, um, if you can actually condense and structure that so it takes a little bit more to get down to, oh, here's a page I want to read. But at least here's the context it's in, maybe it could flag that though there's a controversy between these two sides of this field or in, in this political argument about whatever. Um, uh, you can see that if you read everything. And the only thing that can read everything anymore is the machine. Um, and that, that's truly something that's changed um, culturally uh, that 100, well, 
100 years ago, we were hitting that limit. Um, and even then, people were talking about the good old days where, you know, uh, a gentleman could, could read all of the classics in his study at Oxford or whatever, right? I mean, the good old days had never existed for anybody, but, but people, people yearn for them all the time. Um, so, so I think there's a force now that actually counters that to, to some small degree. And the better we can use it to, to show that up, I think, the better off we're going to be before people get lost in their own little solipsistic literary universes. OK. Um, you started out saying that text was not written speech. And so now with devices able to record speech and media and video, what becomes conversation and what becomes written information are now the same mess. So how does the, all the things you're talking about become able to address text as text and speech into text? Yeah, well, yeah. great question. Um, and one I haven't truly uh, thought about, but the, the, the the, the simple piece of it that, that I've noticed is that when you transcribe it, the speech becomes text. And suddenly you can do with it all of the things you could do with text that you couldn't do with speech. Um, you know, speech is ephemeral, um, even though we're recording this, right? So, so yeah, maybe it's not so ephemeral anymore. <laughs> but um, it's, it's got totally different properties, right? You still can't, you know, get a, you, you can't, you can't see the whole conversation at once if you're listening to it. Um, you have to listen to it linearly. Um, you might be able to do that quickly, but, but it's still a linear process. Whereas once it gets written down, you can say, oh, there's this, and then that guy responded, and then this person did this, and then, and then she did that. And, um, and, and it, Yeah. Which text does not have. That's true. That stuff gets lost, uh, as with any transcription. Uh, hi. Is this? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if this is uh, Scalia's ghost haunting me, but uh, one thing that kind of pops into my mind as you're speaking about this is the concept of a living document or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and this is true with, like, or, okay, we're in the valley, so I can use maybe a phrase like version control or something is maybe a similar idea. Yeah. Which we had, like, different editions of books, even hundreds, thousands of years ago. Okay, fine. Um, there's a different thing that seems to be happening, which is somewhat related to these contextual little, like, modal windows that pop up, like, who is Nancy Pelosi or whatever, but it's with the meaning of words. And I'm wondering how you if you found in your, your sort of journey here, things that address um, the changing notion of, of meaning. It seems like some of these words that we have in text are actually maybe functions. I don't know if I'm getting a little too computery, but for no, instance, no, no, if I the New York Times writes point. an article about gun control or gun violence, they'll have a number, right? They, it's kind of interesting. So they have a number, oh, 217 deaths so far this year. But if I read that article in three weeks, that number will have changed, but that document is static forever. Right. Unless they go back, which they rarely do, you know, after a day or two. Where it seems like some of these pieces of text actually might be better served to us as readers as functions, right? So they're, they're just, rather than static entities, like does that change the notion of a version of a document and things? I'm, I'm lost in this world, sorry. No, no, I think it, it uh, that's a great question because some of the things that you that you see as text are um, or or see graphically are sort of live representations of what's going on, right? They're real. They're really sort of queries about the state of the world, right? So functions in the sense you're talking about, um, you know. So you look at uh, you look at an online map today. It gives you traffic information, right? How busy are all the roads? Well, that applies to now. And, and it's going to be different two hours from now uh, or next morning at rush hour. Um, I think the same is true for some of those facts, right? So there are, you know, like there's a billboard outside of Washington with the uh, current federal deficit. And it's just, you know, spinning along at whatever rate we're spending money. Um, 
or McDonald's and, and how many, right, and how many burgers they've sold, right? I remember that. Um, and in the old, the really old version, right, it was, you know, hanging number placards and somebody would come out every month or something and update it. And then it became, you know, uh, LED lights or what, and, and they would, uh, you know, change it live. So the time scale of these things is different too. Um, I think that's something that, that culturally we're going to have to um, begin, begin to, to call out uh, as different from the other kind of information. Because it's, uh, like you say, it's not something that's traditionally there in text because the text never changed before, right? Suddenly it's now totally active. Um, so I think that's a great observation. Um, yeah, I have a question about just kind of think with the future of being able to um, like text being created dynamically based on some criteria, sort of actual, you know, being written automatically, like not with the human hand type of thing. Right. Um, there's a lot of that going on right now. Um, if you read the finance pages or the sports pages uh, in, in certain major newspapers, um, there uh, is quite a lot of the reporting that is generated uh, statistically. Um, so, you know, the event, the trade events, the price fluctuations, the, 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 the score sequence from yesterday's baseball game, um, all of those feed some generation algorithm and then rewrite it as text and throw in all the same kind of phrases and descriptors that, that human writers do when they write that stuff. They talk about, you know, you know uh, uh, last the last minute out in the eighth inning and gives you know these guys the advantage or uh, the Dow plummeted precipitously because of you know some event in Russia or um, and and uh, that stuff is generated uh, you know sans human um, and I think we're going to see more of that especially uh, for summarization. Right, so you do a query about a person or about a news event or about, about something happening in the world, and rather than a pointer to the 5,000 different you know, written articles that, that talk about that thing, uh, it'll either just automatically or, 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 or you know, maybe ask you, do you want a summary of that? And you know, I, can, I can condense that. And Oh, there's four major points of view, and they typically go by these names, and here's what they all say. Um, and then, you know, do you want to dig into any of them further? I would love to see that. And that sort of addresses the other point of, you know, the, the sort of the kind of filter bubble, right? If you're only picking one from your favorite source to read or something, uh, there's no way you could see that. Um, but if you get this total view, now, now at least there's a, there's a hope. Gordon? Yeah. Um, just, just occurred to me, uh, going back over your history of, of text and where it came from, uh, it's interesting to note the emergence uh, of a movement in some ways back to uh, pictographs and things with uh, emoji yeah. and, and how popular they are. And, and you know, it's kind of, they're kind of anti-text. Yes. Um. And they have all of the and, and and they're static. They're not smart. They're not right. No, they're you know, not. They're, they're yeah. not contextual. They're whereas they could be, if that would serve some value of or amusement or something. Yeah, I'm not. Th so so they're so new, right? So l like with all of these things that you have to learn as a as a society, they're so new. We don't necessarily know what they mean, right? Is that is this particular smiley face? really expressing joy at what you just remarked on, or is it sarcastic and snide? And you've got to be pretty aware of the person writing in order to figure that out. Um, uh, and some of them just have, you know, very little meaning at all. I mean, it's, it's who, knows, who knows how those things got, uh, got through the emoji committee uh, and into Unicode. <laughs> um. uh, you were saying, like, being able to choose a flesh tone on a 
on a hand or a face, and it's be it's beginning to get context. Right. Where it's, right. There's like a little bit of sub sub selection within that, but yeah, it's it's very early. It is. It is. Well, I think I, I think that's going to be a great thing to watch. Yeah. Clients often tell me people don't read. I think they're quoting Steve Jobs. Um, what do you say to those people? Um, people read more than they ever have in the history of the world. Um, and people are more literate in, in the sense that they know what, what they're reading actually means than they ever have in the history of the world. Now, they may not be, what, what people might mean when they say that is people aren't reading long form text. You know, nobody's reading that seven-page New Yorker article on, you know, the, the, the Bernie followers and what they're, what they're going to do now. Um, you know, some people are, but, but other people are going to read the, the, the headline and, and move along. But they're reading all the time. We put text uh, on everything now. And you really have to be able to recognize it and understand it in context. Um, even if it's just, um, you know, stop or go. Um, or three or th times a day with water. Or three times a day with water uh, in microscopic font on the part of the label that peels up when you grab the bottle. Um, uh, but um, so I think it's more the form of the text that people are, are reading or not reading that, that is changing. So I, I think that's a lament that's given by you know, people who grew up in an in a education system that has valued long-form reading, um, which has its own values, uh, and doesn't necessarily apply to what everybody needs to get through the day. Um, so people are looking to make, we're forcing people to make quick, short decisions. They don't have time to read. Um, but if you can give some information, Text is incredibly dense. You can get a lot across with 10 words written down. Um, so uh, I don't know what to say to them either. <laughs> I guess that's my show. I think we need to say thank you to our speaker. And thank you all. <laughs>